Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here with episode 267 of the Ham Radio Podcast. And I'm Dustin with Colin's Last Stand and Handsome Phantom. Dustin, thank you so much for making time for us this week. We appreciate you. We're, we're oh, of happy course. to have you. Um, no character this week. Um, this we're moving him a... out. He's phasing out of the show, just yeah. like the comment said. Yep. He's done. So, say, sorry. S- yep. Say your goodbyes, everyone. <laughs> I hope you really enjoyed having Carrick on the show. Uh, yeah, what happened was... Let me... Where's this Discord message? Hold on. I'm trying to bring it up. I thought I had Discord on my phone. Um, something fucked up with his computer, and he couldn't even do his own Twitch stream. Right. Uh, he said something show. with Windows 10. A Windows 10 update is making his uh audio stutter he had to cancel his own stuff so yeah we were uh totally a joke carrick is not leaving i mean unless he hasn't told us so (laughs) (laughs) imagine that that'd be really unfortunate after like the last three weeks of just broad jokes at the audience like you think he's leaving and carrick's like hey guys i'm out peace yeah right (laughs) But um, yeah, it's just Dustin and I this week. Uh, we hope you guys enjoy your stay. Uh, this is normally a three-man podcast. See, this is why, you know, one of the major reasons we brought on Dustin, this would have been a solo show. Right. Now you got me and Dustin. You could have been stuck with just me, and that would have fucking sucked. Damn. So um, here you are with two of us. Um, so yeah, we run a supplemental show called The uh, Extra Slice of Ham. Uh, you get that every Wednesday. It's patron only. Um, last week we talked about leveling up in real life. I'm going back to the gaming stuff after that. Uh, but just, I had to start hiring editors for the channel, uh, just because I, my arm, as you can see, if you're a video, uh, viewer, my arm's fucking up again. And, um, I've realized that physically I cannot do the editing work that I used to do on my channel. Um, I have to, I will one day be able to again, but Right now, I just need to give my arm as much extended rest, and it's always re-aggravated by the clicking of editing. I can click around and type a little bit. That's all fine. But uh, when it comes to editing, uh, my arm fucks up. So pretty much, I need to wear this sleeve. Uh, We're going to look more into it. But uh, yeah, that's one of the major focal points of uh, last week's Extra Slice of Ham, because it was a more personal one. And uh, we'll be back to, to our standard gaming stuff, but you can get that on our Patreon. You can get early access to this show for just a buck, $12 a year. If you have the money, we'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, we get Patreon-exclusive videos. We have our first one uh, rolling out uh, this coming weekend. It's going to be about Elder Scrolls, and it will release in the winter while I'm on break um, in December. Uh, for those of you who are not a part of the Patreon, that's not the paywall, you guys. I've done this for three years. It's just so that I can breathe and have content come on the channel at the same time. So it's a healthy balance. Uh, but that's enough about me. Dustin, what are you up to? What are you doing? What are you promoting? Uh, I, so I don't have anything big to promote, though I do want to say it's funny because I talked to you guys about BPM two weeks ago now. Mm-hmm. And the video I did pretty low viewership especially even for handsome phantom (laughs) but um now skill up did a video and my video shot up so remember who you heard it from first me Mm -hmm. dustin Furman, on this show and and on the hp podcast so check out bpm and you did say it was going to be big i am so i am reviewing it now and uh it's it's something that's all i'll say since there's Uh. you know embargo Obviously, yeah. my my preview was very, very positive. So, um, <laughs> you know, what? I'm going to plug just real quick uh, the HP podcast. It. I've plugged this before, but I want to reiterate uh, it is a really the people who listen to it really like it. And so I feel like if you give it a chance, you might like it. It's um, mm-hmm. probably a little more off the wall than this show. Um not in a better or worse with. way. It's just its own beast. So check it out on iTunes if you just search HP podcast from Handsome Phantom. You'll find I it. I would recommend it. It's a good listen. And uh, I've been on an episode before. It's a good time. Um, I don't know if all your episodes are like this, but uh, our our episode was like an hour or so. It was yeah. like a nice digestible quick listen. Right. Uh, a lot of podcasts, ours included, go on for marathons. And sometimes people don't have time for that so i would uh, i would suggest your show for the listener who maybe wants quick burst podcasts right. i think we are almost consistently almost exactly an hour every mm-hmm. week so 
I think that's good, man. Like, I don't think every show needs to be this insane movie length because people right. start to put it in perspective and go, man, what could I be doing instead of listening to all these shows? So, yeah, I think it's that, good to have that. It, it's weird because there are podcasts that are three hours long that I will listen to throughout the week. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate those. But I also like a good punchy one hour show. Mm-hmm. So there's there's, you know, there's market space for both. Um, Agreed. But yeah, today's been a, a pretty decent day. I uh, oh. I woke up kind of late today for me at like 10 a.m. <laughs> so that's normal for me. <laughs> yeah. So well, it's I, like 1130 now. <laughs> what's weird is that I went to bed a little after two and then I had to we, our car, two of our car. Right now we have three cars, which is weird for two people is absurd. Mm. So we're trying to we're going to sell one of them because we got the new car that I mentioned earlier. So two of them are in the shop. So I had to drive my wife to work at 645. I oh. went home, went back to bed. And at 10 a.m., I was like, it was like it was even harder to wake up at 10 than it was at 645. Didn't mm-hmm. make any sense. So I've just been like drinking coffee and energy drinks. And I'm probably going to die early because of it. But, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> and I went and I bought Tony Hawk today. OK, so we actually we had a we got a code from Activision for PC, which a lot of times when we do content, we'll just like if a game is on the, the team account, then we'll all just play that. But something about Tony Hawk, I was like, I'm going to want to play with friends online and I want to have my own stats. I don't want to have to share them. So I just went and picked it up. So mm-hmm. it's a good place to spend your money. I've heard really good things about the game. Now you picked up. Did you end up getting Captain Tsubasa? I did. It's sitting is, right is it here. Good? Boom. Yes, this game's fucking awesome. Dude, dude. It, yeah. I keep I, seeing I things it. on Twitter. I'm like, this game looks pretty awesome. I love it. I'm so... Here's the thing, man. I'm so shocked they didn't market this game at all. This The day this game came out, nothing. No sponsored videos. Right. Uh, no tweets. Like, I don't even think Bandai tweeted about this. Like, I, there was a launch trailer, I, I would argue, after the game came out. I was playing it last night with a friend online. It is so much fun. It's It plays like FIFA. A little, I'll admit, there's, the only thing that's a little janky about the play is the lead passing. So if you try to kind of kick the ball ahead of someone and lead it to them, that doesn't work that well. But other than that, it's literally like this fucking super crazy anime soccer. Uh, it's like street soccer almost because you're doing these trick moves through people. There's a little bit of like a, a meta play in it where uh, if you dash too early... Someone can dash at you and like shoulder you off the ball. Hmm. So you have to like time your dash to trick through them. So there's a bit of like dynamic moments on the field. And then what I like about scoring in the game is it's all based on a spirit meter rather than in FIFA where it's if you have 95 curve, you're going to fucking roll it around the goalie every shot from the same from the same spot Um, in this game. As you take certain shots that that spirit meter will go down. But if the team's making nice passes, getting tricks off, the spirit meter is going to go up. So it's also about how you're playing in between that. And it, it, it leads to these kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like deadlocks uh, might be the right word. Uh, like you're just like constantly in these like 0-0 or 1-1 games. It's it's really intense. Like it's actually a legitimately good time. So there's a story mode with Tsubasa. There is a, a create your own character mode. I haven't messed with that yet. Um, there's online, there's a dream team where you can kind of, uh, as you rank up in the online league, your power goes up so you can take team members from other teams in the, uh, in the game and put them on yours. Uh, it's almost like ultimate team, but you don't have to pay money at all. Um, so what happens is, like I said, you, your power will go up. So let's say Subasa, he's like 150 power. Um, you could squeeze him onto your team, but that's a lot of space for your like 1000 power cap. But let's say you move up to 1,100. Now you can, say, upgrade your forward to someone who's at, like, 90. Um, so that's kind of how it works. And it, it's a it's a great game. It's really, really fun. And it, it works well online. It's just not, like, a very, obviously, it's not a robust multiplayer game in the sense of tons of people playing and stuff. But, uh, you know, playing against friends. I think you could do a couch co-op as well. I know you like couch co-op. Um, you can do that as well. And so it's just it's a great package. I'm very surprised that not a lot of people have talked about it, at least on my Twitter feed and 
YouTube subscription feed and stuff. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, I don't think I would ever be interested in a soccer game, really. Mm -hmm. But then, like, all you have to do is add the modifier of anime before something. And it's like at least a 50 50 chance I'll be interested then at that point. So it's like anime yeah. soccer. Hell yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm interested at least. So that's cool that it uh, it is weird. The, the marketing is feels like it's non-existent. It was in one stream something. I don't know if it was a PlayStation one or something. I remember seeing it somewhere at some point. Hmm. But yeah, it's kind of weird that they've kind of yeah let it out to die I, like, I just think it's weird because you know they released it for for the u.s i mean i imagine this game will do better in japan but it's just like if they're gonna go to the, all the lengths of translations and whatnot then market it a little bit it's because it, here's the thing is when you look at the bandai anime games it's very rare they do something like this which is like fresh there's mm -hmm. nothing like captain subasa outside of fifa street which i think the last one we got which was in like 2013 um so like having a game like this from them is really unique the last time they made in my opinion a unique anime game was uh attack on titan that was the last oh. time we got never something played that but i'm curious about it it's like a muso game except the combat plays like the show so you're like dashing around and, and right. trying to cut the nape of the neck uh and it's really fun it ko counts so like if you're playing as like mikasa you'll have like 40 ko's which is considered really good uh it's a really satisfying gameplay loop very different from what they normally do uh you know because what i like is that it's not obviously it's a soccer game so it wouldn't be but they're so known for their shitty 3d fighters like jump force and jump my force. hero yeah one punch man like they're all the same cookie cutter i think uh seven deadly sins had the same thing they're just all the same shitty 3d fighters so i'm surprised when they actually do something different which clearly took resources <laughs> like there's no shortage on amazing presentation for the game that they didn't say, like, let's market this. So hopefully right. it does well. I'd love to see more. Yeah, it's uh, it's intriguing. I feel like that's one that I definitely want to look at mm -hmm. at some point, especially if it's like 20 bucks on sale. I don't know if that's a full pricer for me, especially since there's, especially in the next few weeks, like uh, with Kingdoms coming soon. Um, mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to want to play that. And now Tony Hawk. So yeah, there's a lot to play. There's yeah. a lot to play. So. I wasn't going to I bought Avengers today, too, because uh, I did promise my audience I'd review it because a lot of people were like, you're just being negative because you hate the game and you want to suck. I'm like, <laughs> no, I, I told everyone I was going to buy it. I was going to review it. I was not going to do what a lot of other YouTubers did who spent $80 to get their review out early. Uh, sorry, but that the, the cost there does not outweigh right. my yeah the sacrifice. Like I just I was like, I'll wait. I'm not I'm, I'm barely interested in spending $60. Uh, let alone 80 to, to get a video up ahead of the crowd. I'll, I'll, I'll post on Monday. Uh, I'll have the story beat by then. Apparently the story is only like 10 or 11 hours. So it's something I can burst through this weekend. Uh, I only played for about an hour and a half when I got home before this show. So uh, I actually, it's interesting because what I played in the beta was clearly a live service game, right? And what I've played this first hour and a half is clearly a, single player story game that's actually like this Kamala Khan's like the main protagonist and she's not bad and I'm sitting here thinking okay I think they were making a different game at first that's kind of the vibe I got between the beta and what I'm seeing now we'll see how that develops uh, it, it'll be an interesting conversation um but yeah as it stands I'm working on those two games so you said you picked up Tony Hawk have you played any of that today yeah well I played so I was playing the PC version that we got the code for last night. Um, and then I, I played for probably about half hour, 45 minutes and just played the first two levels. And uh, it's good. I mean, it plays it's, it's good because it's a good happy medium between the fact that they, they revised a lot of it to feel more like the later Tony Hawk games, like, you know, underground or whatever, like the good aspects. Cause if you go back and play those first two, they don't play quite as well as you remember, um, at least in my opinion. So it's been it, so long. I don't even remember. Yeah. So they've done a lot of good things to modernize it that I think it, it is good. Um, the the presentation itself is fantastic. I mean, they, they both I mean, obviously, the PC version is going to look better. But as far as the PS4 version, it looked like a locked 60 to me. 
And I know when Digital Foundry did their video about the demo that was in the warehouse level, they got a complete locked 60. And I think it's 1440p on PS4 Pro, maybe Ooh. dynamic. But either way, okay. I have no complaints really about the presentation. It looks good. It feels good. I never played Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5, but I can <laughs> safely assume, I think, that this is worlds better than that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I uh it's funny because for me growing up, I was more into Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 and 4 on the PlayStation 2. I played the first two a little bit, but not quite as much. So, I'm really hoping that I mean, I think it's obvious these are going to be huge hits for Activision. I don't think there's any question in that. They're going to sell millions of copies. But I hope that they do kind of the same thing that they did with Crash and that they'll do one and two. Then they'll follow up with maybe a three and four next year. And then we get a true new Tony Hawk game mm -hmm. at some point that How isn't garbage. It, 40 way. bucks. Nice. So it's it's a good price, unlike uh, Nintendo's uh, <laughs> uh, collection uh. coming soon, uh, which we'll, we're going to get into that. So. But how, how about we do that now? I mean, okay. unless there's uh, more games or intro stuff you want to cover, we could do a nice smooth transition here if you'd like, Dustin. Let's get to right into it, because I feel like that's um, kind of the hot topic going yeah. on right now in, in the biz. So, yeah. So um, Nintendo announced, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, and this has been rumored since I want to say March. It's been that, a while. Uh, yeah, it really has been. It feels this year. I know a lot of people say these these months have gone by really slow. I think this year has flown friggin' by, personally. Right. Um, but Nintendo announced Super Mario 3D All Stars. This consists a, a trifecta package of Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Super Mario Galaxy. They also announced uh, 3D World and Bowser's Fury. So we're gonna, of course, start off. With uh, and, and they did like an AR Super Mario Kart game and um, just a lot of Mario stuff. Like they're putting uh, uh, Mario in like Splatoon. They're doing something with Smash with a tournament. Uh, so big Mario celebration for its 35th anniversary. FYI, next year is Zelda's 35th anniversary. So uh, just know that Nintendo's probably going to repeat the same shit with like, a, I mean, just think about it, dude. Like Majora's Mask Ocarina of Time and like... I don't know. Dude, if they could put that 3DS version that has like the upgraded models and stuff and they can like, you know, freshen it up for the Switch, mm. that'd be amazing. Yeah, dude. I uh I, I feel like they're gonna do it. I feel like it's too coincidental the the way they're going out with it, and especially because they're making it limited. A lot of people have really honed in on the limited aspect of uh Super Mario 3D All Stars. Uh for those who don't know. What Nintendo's doing is they're making it available in like two weeks. It comes out the 18th of September, which is really exciting, in my opinion. A lot of people thought it was weird. I was hyped. I, I like to wait as little as possible for my games. Uh, is it inconvenient as someone who's reviewing a lot of games? Of course. Of course it is. Um, but it's available until March 2021. Then it's ripped off the market physically and digitally. So I think you're going to see a lot of scalpers if you are. I mean, these games have already proven themselves. So it's not like one of those games where I'm usually against pre-orders. I would say it's probably a safe pre-order because scalpers are going to fly in and try to buy as many sealed copies to resell once this thing gets taken down. And I imagine that the reason Nintendo's doing this is kind of like what they did with uh, the Super Nintendo, uh, the, the mini console that they did. Um, and the same thing with the, the NES where they just put them out there, limited run, and then just took it off, uh, to create these items to create almost like an artificial collecting item because they just stopped printing them. Um, so I imagine they're going to do the same thing with Zelda, but back to Mario, Dustin, what do you make of uh, super Mario 3d all-stars and, and everything that Nintendo showed off to us the other day? So let's, let's start with the no without the strings attached of the, um, the limited aspect. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But as far as the game itself, I'm really excited. Like all three of these games are fantastic. I personally have never played through all of Mario Sunshine. So I'm very, very excited to play all of that game. And I think it's awesome that they went and made it widescreen as well. 
So yeah, I'm I'm really excited for a package like this. I think that it is on the expensive side for what other companies offer. Specifically, if you look at Activision, what we were talking about with Tony Hawk, you know, they remade three crash games and sold it for $40. And for this Mario collection, they're just kind of. I don't know what as far as the resolution, I'm assuming they're up them at least. But yeah, yeah, they they're they're making it look better. Right. I don't know if they gave a specific resolution. I'll I'll continue to look up details as right. we go along. But they're not like doing any kind of model. They're not upgrading the models. It's it's like mm-hmm. seems to be kind of the the bare minimum for a remaster and charging sixty dollars for it. But here's the thing, Maddie, is and this comes to the limited aspect of it as well. Nintendo has all of us by the balls, and they mm-hmm. know it. And they're like, oh, God, yeah, they're like, these three games are extremely powerful (laughs) in our lineup and (sighs) we can we can put it out there with all these strings attached and be super shitty and we're going to get away with it. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing is that this is every like this whole limited aspect really, really sucks. And in almost any other situation, I would say, fuck Nintendo don't buy this game Mm -hmm. but they've got me by the balls i want this product so bad that i'm willing to put up with the shitty business practices and i don't know maybe i have no spine that's fine i'm willing to sacrifice (laughs) my dignity because i want this mario collection on the switch that badly that i'm willing to put up with nintendo being assholes so i don't know it's like i guess i'm a hypocrite because as much as shitty as I think it is, I'm still willing to give them my money. And I'm mm-hmm. guessing you're in the same spot. Yeah, yeah. I uh, The one thing I don't like is the stripping of digital sales. Dude, it's I so just, stupid. I think it's so weird. Uh, I The way I look at it is this. And I'm not trying to justify their practices. I just feel like anyone who is remotely interested in this game will pick it up by March. I'd be shocked if... I'm not even trying to say it like in a way like I'm not accounting for finances and stuff. Like I feel like by March, kids, adults, Mario fans, new coming Mario fans, I feel like most will pick it up by then. What what I think a lot of people won't consider is taking it off even the digital market. That sucks because like one day people are going to grow up. I know this is going to cut deep and I get it. It's going to sound a little ridiculous, but you're going to have your own family. Having this collection of games readily available on modern consoles, it's just so weird that that Nintendo doesn't want to do that. You look at Final Fantasy 7, which is available on like everything, right? You look at so many classic games that are available in so many places and then Nintendo just doesn't fucking do that. They're so weird about it. I get it because, I mean, look, I just bought um because i've been game collecting and i saw online explorers of sky the pokemon mystery dungeon game was like a hundred and five dollars and i was at a store and they were selling a complete in box for 80 so i like i get it like the allure of collecting the games i was like yeah I'm, i'm buying that shit because that's a good deal right there um so i totally get why nintendo tries to short print their stuff but but part of the reason like earthbound was so expensive or i'm sorry is so expensive um, is is because it's not available really anywhere else. Uh, so it, it, it got short printed uh, in, in its initial launch, which makes sense. I don't think they anticipated to have the cult following it did. And it's in these, now they're trying to replicate that in these artificial means. And I just think that's the weird part of it all. It's not like they have the money to, to even if a game is like destined to flop, they have the money to just be like, let's print these out, right? And I just, that alone I think is really weird. I don't know. I'm not a fan of it, but I will to 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 answer your original statement or question. Sorry. I will be buying it. Yeah, they got I'm telling you, they they got your balls and they're just they got them and you can't Mm. move other than Mm. other than to give them sixty dollars for three games. I just they're not even upgrading a little string loosely tied around. Okay, And I'm just like, no, I'm not going to 
and oh, they just and you're, give it a little pull. Yeah, yeah. And I'm your just voice like, goes oh, like you got yeah, a little voice yeah. crack when, <laughs> when they pull. Yeah. So you know, um, so there used to be a podcast that Polygon put out called uh, Cool Games Inc. That I think uh, Griffin McElroy. They made this was a joke they made on the podcast, but I actually think it's so true. And I think about this regularly. The joke was that Miyamoto made a deal with the devil and the devil said, Nintendo, you guys are going to have classics. You're going to make some of the best games. You're going to be beloved by the world, but (laughs) there is going to be one major thing wrong with nearly everything you release. And it's like the NES classic. It's great. Those cables though, on the, on the controllers, two and a half feet <laughs> like yeah and then it's like oh this it, and it applies to this this mario collection it's like mario collection uh yeah it's gonna have to be limited like everything nintendo puts out there's just like one thing the switch uh yeah that kickstand worthless um you know what i mean <laughs> like so and uh, there, among other things with the switch that it's like i get you, what you're saying you though. love That's these so products and there's always something so wrong like the thing with this limited aspect of it is I'm like, Nintendo, do you want people to pirate your products? Do you want people to just download ROMs? Because this is how you get them to do it. If mm-hmm. somebody a year from now is like, man, I want to play Mario 64, and they're not able to purchase it on their Switch, they're just going to download it for free on their computer. Because what yeah. else are they supposed to do? Especially because they're they're making it... Of, they Now we know it can go on the Switch, right? Like, there's right. no technical hurdle. So it's really weird. My other theory was that... And I, a lot of people have said this, so it's not like an original one, but that Nintendo Online might expand into the N64 and oh. they're going to have Super Mario 64 in there. I could see something like that happening um, because clearly they figured out if, if Super Mario 64 can come to the Switch... Then they figure out how to take the weird controller known as, as the Nintendo 64 controller and remap that to the Switch. And so if Mario can do it, uh, I'll be curious to see what other games they could do with that. And I imagine that method, pardon me, I just had a protein shake, could apply uh, to other games. So that was my other main theory. Uh, but I really think it's just to to, to bolster this this artificial shortage that they, they like to create with almost all their games um because i get it like when i bought captain subasa i was at gamestop and uh, i called them and i said can you please hold a copy for me i'm literally heading up now and when i got up there i guess he forgot but he was just like yeah this is actually uh my last copy good thing you came in uh he's like this is really niche we have like a very limited supply like that makes sense captain subasa is a game that stores shouldn't buy large stock of unless they see a large demand and then they could say like, okay, put five down, and and we'll call you when the copies come in. All that shit, sure. But with something like Super Mario, it just is really. It's a weird move. It's weird. It's absolutely weird. And I think you're right because now what's going to happen, Dustin, is you've tainted how I look at everything Nintendo. I will say, <laughs> well, because like, yeah, look at like Smash. I was about to say, hold on, look at Smash though. That's not that bad. But Smash Online sucks, dude. Uh, there's I will it's say, always one thing. I will say, Luigi's Mansion Three might be clean. That one okay. might that one might be clean. That is that is one of the best exclusives in my opinion. Same thing with Mario and Rabbits. Oh my god, one of the best games ever. I love that game. Um, they also announced, by the way, that the full Wii U Super Mario 3D World will be coming, as well as what seems to be an expansion called Bowser's Fury. Now this is actually entirely new. This whole Bowser's Fury thing. It was a tease in the trailer. Uh, No one has an idea of what it is, but a press release promises we'll learn more details later. Uh, This is actually coming February 12th of 2021. So there is a separate Mario, a second separate Mario release. So once again, you know me, I like to to leap all over the place. I immediately think of Zelda. I'm like, okay, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, combo package. And then we get to February and they're going to give us like Skyward Sword and Wind Waker or Twilight Princess, Wind Waker, Majora, and uh, and Sky, uh, whatever, Skyward Sword. Like, they're doing it, man. I feel so confident about that. But uh, have you played 3D World? Are you interested in this one at all? You know, this is one of the first games I had when I got a Wii U. Um, mm-hmm. I ended up getting one like way after launch on a pretty good deal. Mm-hmm. And... I like like this game and don't like it at the same time. 
Okay. It's weird because I feel like the multiplayer, which is what they really push, I don't I don't understand the the Mar- a lot of the Mario multiplayer games because like especially with um New Super Mario Brothers, I'm like multiplayer just makes this game harder and more annoying. Like you're jumping all over each other. I and I maybe it's just supposed to be stupid fun. Great. But the same thing applies to Super Mario 3D World that I didn't really enjoy playing the multiplayer. And there are some aspects of the gameplay that kind of throw me off. Like your character automatically, like you'll start moving and then they'll like do a burst of speed. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of threw off the gameplay for me. So the weird part though is watching the trailer. I was like, maybe I should give this a second, second try, which the smart, you know, the smart side of me should just plug in my Wii U and check it out and not spend $60 on it again so we'll see yeah but you got that convenience factor you can take that Dude, that bad boy wherever and who wants to play the wii u honestly with that yeah. chunky ass controller i mean I there was a lot of games i really liked on wii u i in a way i think the wii u is kind of underrated oh, really? but just on a on a software standpoint i think I they had a lot yeah. of good stuff that gamepad though i mean was just mm-hmm. No I mean, the way the way I look at it is there's a reason why Nintendo ported so many games from the Switch or I'm sorry, from the Wii U to the Switch. Right. <laughs> so, and that's half the library people rave over. Um, and a lot of the, the library that we got this year, um, well, three, well, three worlds next year, but Pikmin three is coming uh, this year. What else do they do? Xenoblade Definitive Edition. So like, yeah, they just been they just been tapping into the Wii U, which it's surprisingly like normally you predict Nintendo to do something and then they do the opposite. Uh, I was really, uh, I was really surprised to see like people were right on the money with that. They've just been tapping into that. Hopefully they tap into Metroid prime in some way, shape or form. That'd be really nice. I'd be a fan of that personally. You have to imagine with this, um, with Zelda, the Zelda anniversary that they're going to push out, um, wind waker and the, Wii one, why it's slipping my name the name is slipping Twilight my mind Princess. yes yeah i'm wondering if one. they're generous enough to do a dual pack of those two for 60 for sure. but i'm also like yeah nintendo probably would just be happy to put both of those out for 60 dollars each so they would be they would be and, th- and they would get away with it too <clears throat> because again they got people by the balls i keep saying that i'm sorry <clears throat> but it's true because yeah. people fucking love nintendo myself included and Maybe it's unjustified in some ways. Maybe it's a nostalgia bump, and I'm perfectly willing to admit that, but it's the reality. Yeah, but at the same time, it is good value, right? Like, mm-hmm. it, I guess compared to industry standards, it, it should be cheaper, but it is still good value. It is still three full, really significant games for $60, and um, while we could say, like, Tony Hawk is 40 I mean, how short are those Tony Hawk games, right? Like, yeah, you can, I don't... You can breeze right through them. And I don't yeah. like this and everything, but I'm just food for thought, I guess. Right. That Spyro collection was very good value with mm-hmm. all three of those games. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, there's, yeah, there's better remasters than uh, price price wise than than this for sure. Yeah, I would agree. So we'll see. I, I man, you got me excited thinking about the. Uh, ocarina of time on on switch would just be so good i love that game i really do i mean everyone i know that there's some people that that like other ones more but i i just have to it's a classic dude like ocarina of time is is so fucking good can't go wrong so weird that they just like sit on things like that right you once again i'll use my final fantasy 7 example you see square enix is like all right people like this let's fucking put it everywhere nintendo oh you like this fuck you like, right it's just it's so fucking weird well man. dude that they they hold it for so long that when they put it together in a collection with three games and they barely have to do any work to put them together then they can charge you 60 dollars, and you're not even going to question it i mean i guess we're questioning it but it's not going to stop us so mm-hmm. Because they've held the, you know, they've held these three Mario games and not put them on Switch. I I feel like part of it is because, like, they're so big and powerful that you're not going to stop, like, the mom from going in the store 
and buying right. it for her kid. Hey, wait. This shouldn't be sixty dollars. She's gonna yeah. be like, "It's three Mario games for my kid. Get the fuck out of my way!" Like, right? Yeah, you know, that's well, not gonna stop her. And and this is the thing is that we have to also just consider that value isn't inherently tied to like, you know, a list of bullet points or what a game contains. Value mm. is also a personal thing. So, the ability to play those three games on the Switch is worth. $60 to me regardless of how much work or remastered stuff. Of course I would love those things, but yeah, it's I I will purchase those and it's fine. I'm I'm going to have a great time and it'll be it'll be worth the money mm-hmm. for me. And I'm, you know, not everyone's always lucky enough to or you know has the has the financial means to do that. So, I'm not trying to say just like oh yeah, well, if it's worth it buy it. So, I don't know. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, we only got a couple of weeks ago, and we'll have impressions, I'm sure, on the show. Oh, talking yeah. about it. And that'll be a good time. Uh, now we'll move into NVIDIA. NVIDIA had a lot of announcements. Now, I'm not like a hardcore PC gamer, especially uh, as I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. But, of course, on my arm, I'm going to be gaming with keyboard and mouse far fucking less. So I'm I'm all about that controller life. That does not mean that graphics cards do not matter to me, but uh, I just wasn't paying close attention to this one. Uh, I've seen, of course, the many tweets, the many pictures. Dustin, uh, you wanted to go ahead and put this in the show, so yes. of course, lead this off for us. Go ahead and 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 bra- and and just rain knowledge on me. So okay, GeForce. They are the the market leader as far. I mean, there's GeForce, and then there's um. AMD, which also has their graphics cards, but whatever. So what they announced, this is the new 30 series lineup. And what's exciting about these new cards is that the the last generation was kind of middling for people. Sure, they introduced ray tracing um, and they also in, introduced DLSS, which has been pretty cool. But there wasn't a as big as of an upgrade as people would have liked. And so sales were kind of soft and Nvidia went hard with the 30 series. So to put this in perspective, they launched, they're launching three different cards. Currently there will be more down the line. They'll announce like a 3060, but uh, there's the 3070, the 3080 and the 3090. Now, as far as the last generation numbers, the, what do they mean? Yeah. (laughs) So the the current right now available best card is the 2080 Ti when it comes to their their gaming line, right? 2080 Ti, I believe, is MSRP fifteen hundred dollars. So it's a very expensive card, but it is also very, very powerful. It can do 4K 60 um, ray tracing is a bit still mixed on basically all of their 20 series, but so. Okay. Yeah. $1,500 for their flagship. Now the let's, let's start with the base card, the, the GeForce RTX 3070. The 3070 is more powerful or I don't, I'm trying to remember if it's as powerful or more powerful. We'll just go with as powerful or more than the 2080 or the, yeah, the 2080 Ti. And it mm-hmm. costs, Five hundred dollars. So yeah, that was the one that caught my eye because of its value, dude. Yeah, for five hundred dollars, it is more powerful than a card that's two weeks ago, three times the price. That's pretty awesome. Now the thirty eighty T or the thirty eighty, that is what they're calling their flagship card. It costs six ninety nine, and it is it is twice as powerful as the 2080 ti now that's the card that i had which i was thought was a really great card i was rocking 1440p high frame rate on pretty much everything and so you know twice as powerful as the previous generation that is a significant upgrade much more powerful than the 1500 dollar 2080 so that's the one that I'm going to be purchasing and I actually just sold my 2080 that I did have. I kind of, it sucks for a lot of people that are, are selling their current cards because they 
lost so much value almost instantly. It's funny because my friend, my friend, Sean Clinton, a few weeks ago, he's like, dude, you should probably sell your 2080 because you're going to get a lot more value for it now. And I meant to do it. And then I, it just caught up, caught up on me. And so I ended up selling mine for like $400, which wasn't that bad because I actually accidentally got it on a price error for around 400. So I pretty much went out even, but normally that card was like six or $700. So now the RTX 3090 is the beast card. Mm, Okay. And basically the one that they took out of the oven, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. He took it out of the oven. Okay. And basically this card, they're saying it can do 8k gaming at 60 FPS. Who's so, gonna do that? <laughs> yeah, so if this is the insane um, top of the line card, I th- believe that it is fifteen hundred dollars as well. I'm avoiding talking about a lot of the specific technical aspects of the cards because that's kind of where I do have some knowledge, but I'm too scared of fucking it up and sounding like an idiot. So I'm just we're mm. keeping it bare bones. Um, it's fine with me. You have yeah. my ear. So you got so, my ear. You got their ear. Yeah, so it's exciting just because this is one of the biggest jumps, at least what Digital Foundry was saying is that we haven't seen a jump in graphics power between generations like this for like a really long time. Okay, so the 3070 is, I mean, at $500 is still a very, while it is still very expensive, the amount of value is is very high. So I don't know. It's exciting. Um, these cards are definitely going to hold their own very well against PlayStation five and Xbox series X. Obviously they're a lot more expensive than buying a console, but you will get a higher quality gaming experience. Let's say like right now I have, and this is probably a good question to ask not only for myself, but anyone listening who might be in the more amateur area. Um, so right now, um, I have a, what is a 980 TI? Oh, so yeah, it's, it's getting, yeah, it's getting time to upgrade. It's ancient sure. in the world of, uh, computer parts. Yeah. It still runs just, everything yeah. just fine, but you know, it's getting time to upgrade. Now, when I upgrade that, I have, a th- I think it's, a, it's a i7 quad core 3.74 gigahertz. Do you have to upgrade? Would I would I hypothetically have to upgrade my processor processor along with the graphics card to keep up with the technology? And if that's too like deep cutting, like I totally you, get it. Right. So again, keeping this bare bones so I don't sound like an idiot. You can bottleneck a video card if your graphics card or if your CPU is not fast enough. Okay. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can check online to see. My gut reaction is that you would still be in the clear to upgrade and you're not going to bottleneck being that you said it's a quad core i7 3.74 gigahertz. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head, but that's fine. Yeah, Yeah, I was just more so picking your brain on it. Right. So the other thing that I meant to look up is that these new graphics cards use PCIe 4.0, which is the new standard of the connection of how it actually connects into your motherboard. Okay. I know that there were some people raising questions about if you have, if you don't have the newest standard, if you have a 3.0, if that's going to bottleneck the card, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I built a new PC just within this last year. So I have 4.0. So that's, that's why I don't know is that it wasn't even something that I needed to worry about. So yeah, see, I'm trying to key into all of that stuff now after the fact because I've had this PC next to me. It's an amazing PC. I spent about two grand on it. It's lasted me five years, and I'm sure it could last me longer, uh, but it's starting to have a power cycling issue. Sometimes when I hit the power button, it'll turn on and off, on and off until it eventually just gets through the full boot. Right. Um, so it's, it's getting to the point where it's, it's not by any stretch of the imagination on its last legs. It's still very powerful. Um, but I'm starting to, to, to look obviously to the new generation. Um, cause I think right now my money is going to focus on the consoles or at least right now, PlayStation five. I don't even know about series X. 
quite frankly, uh, and then upgrading my PC afterwards just for video work for any like, you know, we, we get preview codes, review codes pretty frequently on PC because it's easier to distribute the codes to the storefronts there. So if we're getting some big next gen title, I got to be able to play the sucker, right? So I've so, been looking into that now, but uh, sorry, what were we about to say? What What's the resolution on your monitors that you're playing at when you play on PC? I have a old, 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 old monitor. I bought this shit in 2012. It's oh. 1600 by 900. Oh, like, shit. You're not even yeah. rocking 1080p, Maddie. Mm-mm. No. Oh, boy. I, mm-mm. So you I really do don't have a reason, most likely, to upgrade because... I have a good monitor at my studio. I have oh, a, okay. I have a um, 28-inch... What was it? It's a... Um, oh, my God. Predator Acer. Uh, Acer Predator monitor that's an incredible monitor i love it it's why i have it there for here at home though i'm i'm usually like editing on this thing so like i don't need anything crazy plus my desk space i have like a little tv behind here it's about 28 inches so i just don't have room for another big monitor the second i do though i'm absolutely upgrading to it um but i don't know i've never been like the creator who needs like a triple screen or even a a dual screen when i had a dual screen i just I didn't use the other screen. So I was like, this is not cost efficient for me at all. So I, I moved that second monitor to my studio and, and that's worked out pretty well for me. Um, right. But the second I can upgrade this, I'm absolutely going to, but right now as it stands, yeah, I'm, I'm gaming on a very old Acer monitor. Right. I'm obsessed with monitors and displays. Like I get it. I, if I, I can't flip the camera around, but I have two, 32 inch 1440p 144 hertz monitors and i have a vertical monitor on my right side for displaying whatever um so yeah dude i'll tell you the the biggest thing one of the biggest upgrades as far as monitors in my opinion is having a high refresh rate monitor and playing games at you know 144 hertz or 144 fps is awesome a huge difference um one that i highly recommend and it may honestly it's kind of ruined me a little bit because when i was buying tony hawk today i was like you know you probably should just get this on pc and then you could play it at super high frame rates and stuff and i was like "Mm, i just want the convenience of being able to play it on a console at any point but now it's in the back of my head like man Mm -hmm. i just i love playing games at high frame rate i love it so i guess think about it yeah I get that entirely. Um, it, that's a that's a major difference maker, and I'm sure leading into this new generation, it's gonna be even bigger. See, this is like these are the things that are a true testament to how much I just like games. Right? I don't need the fancy shit. I just I'm gaming on 1080p out here, baby. That or I'm stupid. Damn. One or the other. You guys choose for me, <laughs> dude. That's how Colin is, and I always have to shake my head. He was saying on on Sacred Symbols that he didn't like surround sound. He would turn it off and just use TV speakers. I was oh, that's, like, that's a weird move. I TV speakers. I, I gotta... dude, like <laughs> I bought a new TV earlier in the year in uh, like one of the the OLED TVs and I heard the sound on it. and I was like, God, no, <laughs> like it was so bad. <laughs> and he has the same TV as me. And I'm like, dude, I can't believe that. But yeah. hey, I mean, honestly, it's probably more of a blessing to not care about fidelity because Someone like me who I care too much about fidelity and it ruins things for me and I hate myself for it often that I'm like, oh, this uh, this frame rate could be better. This resolution could be better. That's mm-hmm. constantly what I'm thinking. Or I'm playing a game on PC and then I'm like, hmm, maybe I should fuck around with the settings a little more. And then I'll like mess around and do some stuff. And then I'm like, it still could be better. And then I end up spending so much time messing with settings it's like you should just play the damn yeah, game. There's so it just takes a special type of person. You should embrace that because I'm not even remotely close to that. Like I'll go in the settings. Like when I review a game, I'll go into the settings, show off the options visually. Like on, let's say I'm doing a review, I'll show them off on screen and kind of briefly talk about them because I know there are people who care. I'm not one of them who like digs deep. Like right, if I'm playing on high or ultra high right now, I could give a fuck. I really. I don't care. Right. Like it's just that, that type of stuff does not drive me up a wall. It's almost like an ego thing. When I'm running on ultra high, I feel good. It's like, fuck. Yeah. 
everything's right. beefed out but like i don't really care how it looks i just feel good like my rig is sick dude that's how i felt when i first got this thing it was running everything at ultra high no problem i was dominating games but um as time's gone on you know the course software is uh you know quickly beat out my hardware and uh i just learned to let go you know that's that's the way to be man i mean <clears throat> the reason i'm upgrading right now is because i'm so i'm selling my 3080 and I have a 1070 that I'm also selling. Wait, your 3080 or 2080? Wait, I'm buying the 3080. Yes. I'm selling my 2080. Okay. And I'm also selling my, but the card I had before that, my 1070. So the combination oh of those two things, it's going to be around the same. Like, I'm not going to be paying a lot of money You're out of trading pocket. In. You're doing yeah. a little GameStop trade in here. And dude, I just like, I'm so excited about the idea of playing games at, 4k and trying to get them at 120 fps on my oled no, that's like awesome that's, that's like awesome. The, the thought of playing doom at that like that just is like it tickles me in a certain way that other things <laughs> do not is it sexual uh, i won't say okay you know you never know okay. no i'm a fan it's of this a I'm fetish a or this. something so i'm a fan of this i i like that uh you're willing to open up about this it's important mm. yeah all right dustin Aside from your your love with hardware, we got a little more news to get into, and okay. then we'll get into the patron questions. Uh, Prince of Persia is set to make a return this week, or at least a, an announced return. So uh, Jason Schreier went ahead and pretty much said to expect this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bring up the article now. Uh, the reason I'm delaying is because I had an article up about um, healthy dinners that my girlfriend could make. She's currently mm. on like a a big weight loss journey. So I had to, to buy some time as I switched my tabs. So Ubisoft is reportedly planning to announce a Prince of Persia remake during its upcoming Ubisoft forward event, which is taking place on September 10th. They're promising big news and new games. Speaking on the latest triple click podcast, Bloomberg reporter, Jason Trier claimed Ubisoft is planning to use the event to announce a bunch of games like the Prince of Persia remake that was leaked a couple of weeks ago. Retailer Max.com.gt recently published and then pulled the listing for Prince of Persia Remake for Switch and PS4. Uh, it hasn't gotten a full installment since 2010's Forgotten Sands. Uh, in 2018, Ubisoft released a mobile spinoff called Escape, but otherwise the series has been superseded by Assassin's Creed, a franchise which itself started life as a Prince of Persia spinoff, which I always thought that was kind of interesting, right? Yeah. Uh... In 2013, then Ubisoft Montreal CEO Giannis Malat said the franchise was paused. I'm not scared at all for Prince of Persia fans, he told IGN. We'll find something to entertain them in the future. Prince of Persia is part of Ubisoft's portfolio. So, Dustin, what do you make of Prince of Persia coming back? You know, this is a series that I do not have a lot of experience with, but I know that a lot of people really like this so mm. it makes sense it's been gone long enough that it uh makes sense to bring back though it would make more sense to me to bring back splinter cell because it seems like there's more outcry for that which they got you know with all the way that they're <sighs> with all the different things they're doing with putting sam fisher in different properties you'd have to assume they're building up to something but You'd they could so. also just be fucking around. So, I think so. But, dude, okay, I know this is unrelated, but they leaked that Gods and Monsters is now going to be called Immortals Phoenix Rising. And I just yeah. want to say publicly on the record, along with many other people in this industry, that that name fucking sucks. Yeah, they, I, the Gods and Monsters clicked better. Just sounds right. That sounds like a boardroom name. Like... Not even that, like, Gods and Monsters, I think, is a kind of interesting, okay name, but, like, significantly better than Immortals Phoenix Rising. Mm -hmm. Like, that sounds I... like the name of a fake game that's within, like, a TV or movie show or <laughs> mo movie so or, like, true. <laughs> or within another, like, <laughs> Immortals Phoenix Rising is the game that your kid play, the character, your main character's kid plays in Grand Theft Auto or something. You know what I mean? Like, mm hmm mm-hmm i just yeah. i hate that yeah it's but, funny you mentioned that i i just think you know marketing wise gods and monsters you can read that and get an idea 
of what it is. I think that's so important with naming schemes nowadays is people don't care to research oftentimes. So you need your name to be like, this is what our game is about. And I just, I, I don't know, man. I understand like the feeling of liking the name of your game, but if you put it out there and people know it as something for like over a year, I feel like it hurts your game to come out and rename it, especially Agreed. before a re-reveal seemingly. Cause I imagine with them changing the name, uh, we're going to see something at the Ubisoft forward event. So yeah, I think it's weird as for, as for Prince of Persia. Um, I think it's good that this is coming back because a lot of people don't like where Assassin's Creed is heading with its very action oriented, uh, approach, very open world RPG focused now with both Valhalla and Odyssey. Uh, whereas Prince of Persia was always a kind of stealth action hybrid with some uh, superpower, so to speak, thrown into the mix. And it was really cool. There was one on the Wii. I think it actually was Forgotten Sands. Uh, someone in the comments can remind me, but you had like two versions of the main character. He had like a dark form and a light form. Um, it was actually kind of reminded me of, of Jack and Daxter uh, or Jack 3 rather. Um, so I, I just, something about that game really clicked for me also playing it on the Wii and like using the Wii mode to like motion for attacks. I remember as a kid, that was like one of my little fascinations between that and twilight princess. Those games were awesome to me because I was, it was more interactive. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for it to come back. Cause I think it can, uh, uh, fill a void that Ubisoft sort of left as they tried to grow and rebrand Assassin's Creed from what it once was. And so ultimately, I think it's a smart decision. I'll be curious to see what they're doing with it, right? We're hearing it's a remake of the original game. Uh, I never played the original game. I only watched a little bit of it when I was younger. Uh, so it'll be a fresh experience for me. But I, I personally think it's a smart move all around. And uh, given that a lot's changing with Ubisoft now, I'm curious to see how their games become structured. Because apparently there was a lot of, uh, with the higher ups, a lot of people like, essentially like choking the development of these games and what they had to be like they, they wanted a specific design i think there was a a leak that a what was it a king arthur game was closed down because oh, like, yeah and and cassandra was supposed to be the lead character but they said no we can't do that which was fucking stupid uh because cassandra is like literally the best character in that whole game um but yeah man it's like one of those things where i'm curious to see where they go now uh, because they're weeding those types of bad creatives out of the business, uh, where where something like Prince of Persia can be vastly different from what Ubisoft games we used to expect from them. Yeah, it's um, it's weird because we've heard a couple instances of Ubisoft leadership changing and either canceling or, um, you know, I wonder if the the name change behind Gods and Monsters is also that. Mm, but that's a good point. And yeah. That. In fact, I was trying to look because there were some leaked screenshots and I recall that it looked different. Like it looked like they may have made it less cartoony, but that may just be in my head. But hmm. yeah. So yeah, I think it's cool though. I mean, I'm always, it's weird because Ubisoft, a lot of their games don't really speak to me. I don't think that they're bad. I just don't, I'm not I wasn't particularly into any of the new Assassin's Creed stuff and I'm not okay. really into Far Cry either but um I'm always down to check it out so yeah we'll see if they see the thing is is since it's a remake it could be a remake in the sense of we're totally redefining what Prince of Persia is or it could be a remake in the faithful sense of we're going to try to recreate a modernized experience of the original game um and I think I feel like Ubisoft makes really underrated. Like when they take those titles and they sort of narrow the focus and do something more action adventure. Like you look at Mario and Rabbids, uh, you look at like Valiant Hearts. They, there was a period of time they did Child of Light. When they narrow their focus and do something creative and different, their games are really fucking good. Like I know those games are, are what I mentioned outside of Mario and Rabbids are relatively dated, but you have these like when they step away from open worlds. I think Ubisoft is a really good developer. Um, I'm sure someone will think of a game that I'm not thinking of right now that like invalidates all of that. But right now I can't think of anything. And I, 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 so I hope when they do this game, it stays to its action adventure 
stealth routes and that they only serve to modernize this experience because I think that's where they work best. I think um, I think they stretch themselves too thin with ideas trying to make everything open world. I don't even know how you'd make Prince of Persia open world personally, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. But it's only a number of days, so there's a good chance that by the time people are listening to this show, Dustin, that uh, they already know. That's so true. it'll be interesting to see what we get right with the with this segment of the podcast. All right. So you may have noticed we're speeding along with this show. Dustin, you've got like 40 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. 630. So yeah, okay. let's, we can go another 40 for yeah. sure. So the original plan, just so people know, and the reason I'm checking with Dustin, the original plan was it was going to be me, Carrick, Dustin. Dustin was going to tag out. He was already, originally, Dustin, you were not going to make this show. So that's yeah, why I, I got said my I, days all screwed up. Ah, so yeah, if I, for, I, yeah, it's a whole thing. I'm, I'm here though. <laughs> Yeah, so we're glad to have you here. It's good you're here. Otherwise, like I said, people would have been really stuck. And so um, with that, we head into patron questions. Some guy writes in. That's not me being a douchebag, by the way. His name is truly some guy. Hi, guys. I recently got a PS Vita. Let's go. Hell yeah. And I was really curious if you had any recommendations I should get. I already have Persona 4, Uncharted, Golden Abyss, and the first Danganronpa. Dustin, this is our segment. This is our segment, brother. Let's go. Let's start it off. Go ahead. So, okay, best PS Vita games. I mean, he's already got Persona 4 and Danganronpa. Um, Mm. Those are the first two I always suggest. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I'm trying to think of the games that drew me in the most. I loved playing Hotline Miami on Vita for some reason. So that's a good one. That's the thing is a lot of these games that I really enjoyed on Vita are available on PS4 or somewhere else. Um, Can you can you hear my wife is uh, mowing the lawn outside right now? Is it coming through? Let's let's take a moment. It would only come through when I talk, I think so. No, no, you're good. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. the next one, Rogue Legacy, is super ah. fun on a handheld. Um, and they're doing Rogue Legacy 2, so it'd be a good way to get, you know, a, you know, a, familiar with the, the franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, just go ahead and pick up Danganronpa 2 while you're at it, because uh, yeah. that's yeah, also you're awesome. There, you're going to. If you, if you like the first, I'd say, couple of hours of Danganronpa 1, I have the utmost confidence you will finish it. I, I've never met anyone who like finishes the first. Actually, I've met one person who finishes the first chapter of Danganronpa and then doesn't finish the whole game. Yeah, uh, that that person would be my best friend. He played yeah. a chapter and then put it down somehow. He loved wow. it, too, but he's just a fucking freak in nature. Um, I'm looking at my Vita shelf or uh, collection. Sorry, right now. Uh, Persona 4 Dancing is one that's exclusive yes. to Vita. And well, that's a great not game. Anymore. It's not. It's, it's on, on PS4. PS4. Oh. Yeah, because it was it was part of the special edition initially for the two, the Persona oh, Three and Persona Five I thought dancing games. Was, okay, I thought that was limited. My bad. I think they went ahead and released it digitally because it was exclusive to that package for a while. You know what? My 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 friend got that. So you know what? Yeah, yeah. But you're, you're correct. We talked about. I don't know if this was on a show or not, but it, I know those games say. are better on Vita. It was. Yep. I think it was on. Uh, was it on our spoiler cast on CLS? Potentially. I think yeah. it was because we talked about our our woes with TV persona dancing and yeah. how you just felt bad, and then you started playing it on your Vita, and suddenly you were getting King Crazies left and right. For sure. Yeah. I don't know something about the big screen for that game doesn't work. But yeah, I uh, let's see. I, I like, you know, the, the thing with the Vita is it very much did what the switch is doing now. It just came. I, I just think they just fucked up with like the, the memory stick and stuff. And that's what put it in its grave because uh, you can get like Ninja Gaiden. Um, oh, by the way, a lot of these games, I would say, if you have a decent sized memory card, try to download because I have a physical collection and I've always held on to my Vita games just because I, I love the system. Uh, but I didn't realize physical games for that system because it's it's now like out of market um, are really expensive. 
Hmm. Uh, like Ninja Gaiden was one I saw. I have Sigma too, which I love that game. It's one I'd recommend, but I'm pretty sure that's like 70 bucks online or something like that. Like it's pretty expensive. It's way more than what it should be. Um, I'd recommend the Sly Cooper collection. That should be relatively cheap and easy to get your hands on. You get Sly one through three for like, I think 20 bucks. So that's a pretty good deal. You can also get Sly four, um, zero escape virtues last reward. If you're, that's, if you're open to Dank and Rampa, that's what I was the other one that I was going to bring up. So I'm glad you mm-hmm. said it because that game had me glued to yeah. my Vita like big time. So, yeah, which there is, it is a sequel to nine hours, nine persons, nine doors. So that one is available on PlayStation four, but I don't think it's on Vita. Uh, yeah, I'm actually unsure. I don't think it is either. You'd have to double check. Actually, yeah, I'm looking right now. I I think it is because if they have Time Dilemma and Virtues oh, Last dude. Reward, they have. Yeah, to. it is. It's yeah. so it's a collection now called the Nonary Games, and it's and on it, Vita, and it is on Vita. Cool, cool. That's it good. would be hard to get physical though. I'm guessing, but yeah, that includes nine 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 and virtues last reward so that that's got to be a lot of money these these niche japanese games go for so much i have a and i'm gonna unseal it i because i plan to play it i'm not like that where i buy games and leave them sealed like that just it drives me up a wall i look at it every day i have a sealed copy of uh, east 8 uh lacrimosa of dana uh that's a action rpg and um it was sold for forty dollars at pax east i i saw it there and i was like i want to play this game so i bought it for 40 bucks i look on ebay it's like a hundred dollars sealed so Hmm. got a really good deal on that um but yeah another one i'd suggest is freedom wars um that one was surprisingly cheap last time i looked like five or ten bucks um and I, i thought that was that was really shocking i think that's because there was a lot of hype behind that game and a lot of people did buy it uh, when they bought the Vita, because it was supposed to be like the definitive Monster Hunter game. Everyone, for some reason, coined that the the Vita needed a Monster Hunter title to be successful. Because I think the DS had uh, Ultimate, 3 Ultimate or something like that. And so, everyone always thought that's what the Vita needed. Because they had Soul Sacrifice, uh, which is a solid game. They had uh, Freedom Wars, and they had something else. And so... Uh, that's, that's one that if you're into monster hunter style games, it's about, you've been sentenced to prison, prison for like 5 million years. And after you complete each mission, your prison sentence goes down. Uh, last recommendation for me would be legends of heroes, trails of cold steel. The only thing is that you don't get the turbo mode, which my friends use in the PS4 versions. And they are going through the game significantly quicker than me. My friend's already like halfway through the second one because of turbo mode. And he's playing it a lot more than me. I'm still like 45 hours into the first one, but I admittedly have put it down a bunch of times to play other games, but I always want to get back to it. When I pick it up, I enjoy it. It's a good game if you like Persona. And if you're not a weeb like Maddie and I are, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> the Killzone Mercenaries, I played a little bit of it, but a lot of people really like oh that as God, far as an, a, yes. an FPS yes, on the Vita. There's still people playing multiplayer for that. I've Whoa. I've hopped on for matches. Yeah, I've That's hopped awesome. on for matches. It's really it's really cool that people are still playing it. And uh, then one that I've heard is fantastic is if you want to go back and play Metal Gear Solid 2, the Vita oh. port is supposed to be very good. It controls so much better. Really? Like it, yeah. Yeah. Man, that's got me interested. Yeah, man. I don't I don't know how to word it. There Actually, you said it earlier. There's just games that play better on Vita. For me, one was Shovel Knight. I could not play Shovel Knight when it came out on the DS because my hands would cramp and it just felt oh. like shit. But then I bought it on Vita and I beat it no problem. Like it felt so good. Um, Metal Gear was one of those games. When I was like playing it on PS3, I want to say, I just something wasn't clicking. I bought it on my Vita and I beat two and three. And I like both those games a lot. I know a lot of people love three, but two is my favorite. This shit's so fucking Dude, it makes no sense. Like Konami should really just put out that eight Metal Gear Solid HD collection on Switch. Like I it's know, done. Right? All they got to do is port it over, and they instantly will make money. They, they did won't. it for like what Castlevania. They did a cool collection of games. They did one right. for I want to say Contra. Like they've done some collections, so it's not like it's out of the realm of possibility. I get, I think they operate a lot like Nintendo in the sense of going hey we'll we'll do this if we ever need to bump up our quarterly earnings right and they don't need it since they're 
you know, they in in Japan, Konami does pachinko and gym memberships and all kinds of gym stuff that's not games. Wait, what? Yeah, there's Konami uh, gyms, I believe, or is it a Konami health health club or, or something? Let's see. Health Konami health club. What? Yeah, they do all kinds of stuff in Japan that's not gaming. I wonder what their brand image is there. Do people go like, you know, when you look at a product and you see like a brand and, and if it's a brand you trust or a brand you're a fan of like clothing, you like I'll see a Nike symbol and be like, I'm interested a little bit more. I wonder if that's kind of what ha- does Konami carry that weight internationally? Did like because for us, obviously, as gamers, we're like, fuck them. Fuck what they did. But for people who who live in Japan, they do all this stuff. Is that like you see Konami and you feel like, OK. Good company right. here. So according to Wikipedia, they're a Japanese entertainment and gambling con- conglomerate. So they do trading cards, anime, slot machines, pachinko, arcade. Trading cards would be Yu-Gi-Oh! For sure. Yeah. Video game developer, publisher, casinos. And then it says operates health and fitness clubs across Japan. So there wow. you go. Interesting. Holzer19 writes in, first of all, he says he's a part of the Oreo Fork gang, so uh, this will be his last message because he's just no don't longer posting any. You'll regret it. Yeah. I'm just going to ban him real quick. Good. Uh, but first, I'll, I'll read his, his questions. Uh, number one, what is the best slash longest hot streak from a developer you've seen and who is currently on the hottest streak? Hottest streak. I would say, I would say Bethesda Game Studios had the longest hot streak. They went from... I would say, I mean, not that Daggerfall is bad, right? But I think maybe for some folks it started there or even with Arena. I'd say their hot streak really began with Morrowind. And then they had, uh, what did they have? Oblivion. They had Fallout 3. They had Skyrim. That's like an eight-year gap of just fucking dominant titles. Maybe you throw Fallout 4 in the bunch in 2015. I think that was a little more controversial. But still, like eight years of just straight kicking ass. I'd say that's probably the longest streak I saw because there was a time I know it's hard for people to imagine now since 2015, there was a time you saw BGS on the cover and it was actually what I described about Konami. I was like, Oh yeah, this, this shit's going to be fucking good. And right. I, I, it helps so much with, like with feeling good about your purchase. I hope one day they go back to that. Uh, but do you have a, a company in mind like that, that maybe not BGS that, that comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, as far as like straight hits, I mean, Naughty Dog, of course, I know not touching Last of Us Part Two. Let's say even if you forget Last of Us Part Two, because I know that the opinions on it are very mixed. Mm -hmm. Um, Regardless, I mean, if you look at all the Uncharted games, Last of Us One, fantastic. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard because a lot of studios, even if they're really, truly great, they're still not always perfect. Like, I think Blizzard is very well respected. I think that they're kind of been screwing up more recently. So I'll just go with Naughty Dog and we'll leave it at that. That's a fair pick. It says who or he asked, sorry, who is currently on the hottest streak? And I don't know, man. Now, nowadays, I feel like no company can sit in the hot streak area. I think it's almost impossible with how the Internet operates. Uh, because a lot of it's based off PR. So like some people will say, oh, it's definitely CD Projekt Red, but it's like they released The Witcher 3. Right. And that's it. And it's just been like endless praise since then, which, you know, people always take that as a negative thing. Like, I don't like it. It's just they released a game. I think Witcher 2 is amazing. I've been a fan of them since then. Um, but I know for them, like that was their big hype release. That's where they kind of hit their hot streak, so to say. So some would say, oh, it's got to be CD Projekt Red, but one game does not mean a hot streak. They just have a lot of love and praise from gamers right now. Right. Um, man, it's really tough to think of a company who just, you know, I, I have one that is a bit of an interesting pick. Um, I'll be curious to get your thoughts on it. What do you think of Focus Home Interactive? So they've been doing a lot of interesting stuff lately. I know. Oh, let me see here. Focus Home Interactive. Okay, so Vampire, Plague Tale. Is it Vampire or is it Vampire? Vampire. 
Okay, that's what I thought it was. I think it could. I think it can go either way. I know it can't because I remember some jackass commenter was trying to like correct me, and I was like, <laughs> I looked up an interview, and he's like, "Yep, this is our game. It's Vampire," and I was like, "Fuck you, let's go." Um, but yeah, uh, go on. Sorry. Yeah, they're definitely up, up and comers. Like they're putting out more and more really interesting games in kind of the double A space. So yeah, yeah, I, I think they make some really cool games. They're not all amazing. They're not. None of them are like 10 out of 10s, but they just put out, in my opinion, the most consistently like interesting titles. Um, The reason I say that is because I think of when a trailer pops and I see them on it, I go, oh, okay, like, let's see what this is. I think that's an indication of some form of a hot streak. I'm sure there's something in the middle of all that that indicates. Actually, wait, were they involved in what happened with Frogwares, the people who are making um, the, the Sherlock Holmes games? I don't know if that's focus home or okay. Let me look. I'm looking now. Okay. Yeah. They are involved with that. Uh, I'm going to have to roll back my statement. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to have to roll that back real quick. Retraction. Retraction submitted. (laughs) Right. Oh boy. Fuck. Uh, I here I'm holding out. I, I don't know a lot about the story, so I probably really shouldn't comment at all. But it, the thing that I'm wondering about Focus Home and Frogwares, I'm like, well, none of the other publishers are having this problem. And there's always, I don't know. I'm always just curious if there's another side to I get that. the story. But I get that. I just I'm gonna feel give, like with how transparent Frogwares was, I was like, uh, you know, right. I, feel, I feel foolish for even saying that. I will Your say, answer will be better. Go for it. Yeah. Um, real quick, since I know we have a lot of questions and not a lot of time. The other one I want to give a shout out to is Platinum because oh, oh god yeah they've had a lot of crap games because they really spread themselves too thin a few years ago when you're talking like Legend of Korra era and uh, they did that um, Ninja Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game but they we have so many bangers that. so yeah I agree that that it's see I I said Dustin's got a better pick and he comes with the best one. Number two, what what Nintendo exclusive do you think would benefit most from being allowed to be on more powerful consoles? That's a really interesting question, man. What mm. what, what would really? I'm it's so hard because say... they design their their games around the you know how powerful the hardware is. Right. Nintendo exclusive. What would benefit the most? Astral Chain. Really? Why do you yeah, say that? Because I just I I like that game. I just wish it was running at sixty FPS like other. Okay platinum games i just i i get that yeah not that frame rate is everything but i just when i was playing that i was like i think i would it would be a better experience if it was i frame rate. i do hope that gets ported i i love that game i was actually just listening to the soundtrack for it last night um a, a little story for for those listening uh hideki kamiya banned uh blocked me over right. on twitter uh, you know, after after I expressed my hype for <laughs> Astro T- Chain 2, he was uh, casually announcing what Platinum Games' next titles were. He said Bayonetta 3. He said Astro Chain 2, which I was like, I, I responded to him. I went, oh, let's fucking go. Uh, and I hit send, and I was like, wait. I remember hearing that he just bans people from his Twitter account who, who interact with him, who speak English. And, uh, yeah, I quickly got banned, and that was the end of it all, but it was worth it um yeah astro chain is one of my favorite games from them i'd love to see that shit in 60 fps personally i think a lot of people would really dig that game because it's you're literally a cyber cop it's fucking awesome did you ever beat it no i never beat it oh my god maybe i should maybe i should go back i still have it here's the thing man i've just accepted i'm on an island when it comes to astral chain like i really am all no one i know has beat this game and i've i've played through that game like twice i've i've done the end game content like i fucking love that game i think it's so good but i'm really on an island with it i just think story wise universe wise concept combat like i think it's their best game but like no one it sold a million copies or two million copies but no one I know has beat it. It's weird. It's hmm. really weird. Unfortunate, truly. Tropical Ice Cow writes in, Hey guys, a few things before my question. I am shocked that you actually... Uh, I am shocked, as you probably will be, I can actually get Drug Dealer Simulator in Australia on Steam. While I agree with buying the console at launch debate, I have very rarely seen the consoles 
on a significant sale, maybe $20 to $50 at best. So when the PS4 Pro here is $549, it's still a large investment. My advice would be to buy when you think you afford it. Uh, and if that's at launch, you're lucky. Dustin, after the discussion two weeks ago around food, you brought need <laughs> to get a smoker. Uh, you brought me, sorry, to get a smoker. There was autocorrect there. My wife bought me a Pit Boss vertical smoker, and I and <laughs> and I went and got some pizza stones, and they are by far the best pizzas I've ever had. Uh, Better than any pizza. gourmet pizza. Dustin, you fucking changed this man's life. That's why I was like laughing because I saw a head in the message. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then, <laughs> and then the best part is he goes from all of that to, do you think the developers of Cyberpunk and Assassin's Creed know the window of launch for the consoles, or are they in the dark like us? <laughs> from fucking console debates to drug dealing in Australia to smokers to that. Mm -hmm. So we'll answer his question, Dustin, and of course that's mostly directed towards you. So if you got anything you want to sling in there, by all means. Yeah, I'm definitely getting a smoker. I just don't. I might wait till spring at this point, but I, and maybe not. I don't know if there's a good deal in the next few months. I feel like you're gonna get it for Christmas. Oh, you talk about it enough. I feel like your wife's gonna surprise you for Christmas. That would be but a fantastic gift. I'm, which I'm put okay. that in your head. So my my birthday is coming up, and. <clears throat> She got me some coffee and she knows me so well. I'll hold this up for the camera. She got me this pin here. Oh, okay. Totally Do you see tubular. what it is? Totally tubular. My That's... dog sounds. Oh, amazing. you wouldn't know what this is because yeah. you're a fool and you've never oh, no. played Tomba. Oh, Tomba, my. dude. Okay. Tomba enamel pin. So I love that. Hashtag Tomba for life if you appreciate it in the comments. I'm happy so, you're happy, Dustin. That's yeah. all that matters. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, Cyberpunk, do they know the launch window for the consoles? I'm going to say probably yes for their most trusted partners. But hmm. you have to imagine that the reason that Cyberpunk and Call of Duty are launching on the same day is intentional. But that's Dustin. That is that is a great observation. I was about to say, I don't think they do. But I think you're on to something. Yeah. So I don't know. To me, it's just like, I don't know why they would launch those two games at the same day unless there was a console coming out that day. But I think you're, I think you're on to something. Yeah. So who knows? Funk Rat writes in, hey, gang, long time on off listener here. Thank you so much. First time patron. Oh, welcome. Now and again, I'll find myself revisiting old games from my past because it's relaxing to play something familiar, but it's also the same handful of games. The nostalgia brings me back to simpler times where the worries and woes of today can be forgotten, and I can feel like a child again. I call them comfort food games. I like that term. An example would be Skyrim. Once a year, I'll revisit it with, the same, with a new save and play for about a month. My question is, do you have any comfort food games, and if so... What are they, and why those games? I really like this. Thank you for the question, Funk Rat. Dustin, what are your comfort food games? Do you got any you go back to, and you're like, ah, it's good to be here? If I never know, if I have no idea what to play, and I just want to like chill for a little bit, it's always Tetris. And it, almost any version. I mean, right now, if I'm going to play Tetris, it's going to be Tetris Effect right now. But that's always a go-to for me that's just nice and relaxing. A few months ago before uh the main sickness going around i did not have that but i was sick and i went and i played just the beginning of near automata again and it was just so nice something about it. i didn't go through and play the whole game but i just played the beginning and i was like this is great so it was in the moment a nice comforting game for me so but i'm gonna say tetris overall you know I, this is such a tough question to to answer for me because I'm in a similar boat as Funkrat. I like going back to these games because they do bring back a simpler time somehow. It's like you go in a portal and just kind of forget everything. Like even when I'm playing these modern games, it's not like a form of escapism, quite like going back to something. Uh, and so when I look at my shelf behind me, which has like all of my PS2 games, all of my my older games I've been collecting, like each one holds a individual uh, degree of comfort 
for me, what uh, what it has been as of late has been uh, Mega Man Battle Network. This oh. was a game that I played. It's an RPG series. It's on the Game Boy Advance only. I would I would lose my fucking mind if they did like a a full port of one through six. Uh, just for records, you know, just for the record, I have all six games complete in box for my Game Boy Advance. I love these games. Uh, you play as Lan, who's like kind of this kid, and what he, uh, he Mega Man's a program in this universe. So you like jack in to different like locations in the world, and uh, you'll actually be able to like clean out viruses, and and you can go for loot. And it, the, the battle system's kind of like uh, it's grid based, but it's it's action too. So you're like moving around and. It's just very unique for its time. Uh, it's got some snags that older games have, but it's just something with Mega Man, I think, because Mega Man X8 is a game I returned to this year. That's a comforting game. x is one of my favorites because my friend and I used to play that a ton. Um, I like the I like the original Mega Man X, uh, and Mega Man X Command Mission is a uh, Mega Man RPG. I talked about it on uh, Side Quest over on Colin's Last Stand uh, this past week for my collecting video. And uh, that is also another game that I look at and I just feel things. And when I play it, it just is a really, really good time. It just brings me back. So those are just a couple, man. I could go on and on, honestly. I love older games. If I love my content format now, not to go off track here and, and eat up time, but I love my content format now. But if over time I can transition to literally playing what I want and doing re-reviews, I would be over the moon because I would. I'm itching to go back to my PS2 and my GameCube and just crack open so many fucking games. I'm, I just want to go back to so many different games and re-experience them now. Uh, but it's hard to with like, literally I'm sitting next to one, two, we got like two more coming out next week. Like there's so many games to review and it's, it's vital to my career and I don't regret it and I enjoy it, but it's still like, I, my heart wants so badly to, to go back to these older games. Skuma Vendor writes in, Hey guys, looking for some opinions from all three of you. Guess what? You only got two. So, I have a Switch and have had one for a while, but I feel it has been seriously underused. I have around four hours commuting each day, so I have the perfect time to play it, but I always feel like nothing has really grabbed me on that system. Yes, I have Skyrim, but that'll be my 40th playthrough. And Mario Odyssey is overrated. Which Banned. Switch games no. would you... <laughs> Instantly. You're out. You're done. Which Switch games... Would you suggest to try and get stuck to? Mm. Really good question here. And he's got four hours, so I don't think we got to play around with like game length. Okay. Yeah. I mean, to make this short, if you haven't played Breath of the Wild, it's awesome. So there's some problems. I don't. I don't think it's. You know, some people treat it like it's immaculate. There's some problems, but it's still fucking awesome. So that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, Stardew Valley, if you want a more indie title, I think is awesome. Going smash there. ultimate is of course great um mario kart i mean there's just and i feel like there's so many if you've only pl played i mean i don't know i'm trying to he's, he's asking about games he's already talked about skyrim and mario odyssey so let's just assume every other game is on the table then there's so much good stuff i mean yeah you could get Diablo three on your switch and play that for four hours that's, or whatever yeah that's that's definitely something you could you could burn right through. Yeah, man. I mean, obviously my quick two suggestions would be, um, uh, Luigi's mansion three. It's a 10 hour game. Uh, the multiplayer is kind of what gives it a little bit of its longevity. So that may not be the best investment, but I really like that game a lot. Uh, the other would be Mario and rabbits. Carrick and I have talked about that for years on this show and how great we think that game is. Uh, my oddball selections would be, uh, divinity original sin two. Uh, they did bring that to Switch. That is something that's a bit slower paced. Uh, and if you got four hours, like that's the perfect amount of time to put like good divots into that game because that's exactly what it needs. Like just undivided attention for large chunks of time. So it makes it unappealing for people. But if you got four hours just by yourself, man, uh, that's perfect. Astral Chain, of course, we were just talking about that. Um, so I would throw that out there. And uh, maybe like Dragon's Dogma. Um, okay. That's a that's a Switch uh, release. That's pretty good that you could give a shot. So yeah, there's a lot out there. Uh, I think Dustin's suggestion of Diablo three is one. I will, I will signal boost. I think that's a great awesome. game. Yeah. And it's very so good on game. switch. Yeah. So. so give those a look. Mufat cock writes in and, Oh, he got me. I think he got me. Wait. Oh, <laughs> I think he got me. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, and I think you got me. Can everyone, can we ban somebody for every question <laughs> for one reason or another on this show? Uh, are there any unannounced features that you hope are, uh, uh, that you hope for in this coming generation of games? Nothing comes to mind. I mean, I like the one thing I can think of is already partially on one of the next gen is that Xbox has like a, an HDR thing that gives old games HDR, which is really cool. And it's supposed to be very good. I would love if PlayStation had that, but who knows? So nothing instantly comes to mind for me. It's not going to happen, but for me, fully backwards compatibility on um, PlayStation would be really nice. I guess that's something that I agree with. I don't hope for it, though, because I just yeah. know that it's yeah, probably it's not a, happening. There's no shot it happens. I guess more realistically would be uh, in line with what I just said, like a, a solid upgrade to PS Now, um, a larger catalog, really pushing it, maybe bundling it in with PS Plus for a good deal. I'd like to see that move forward. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for PlayStation, and I know they're doing just fine, but I, I think um, I think that could be good for them. And in, in kind of combating Game Pass because there is a value battle there. And I think if PlayStation just put something a little bit better up front, it'd be enough to make people go and turn away from Game Pass and stick with them because they have that option, even if they don't use it. Never writes in, Matt, Carrick, Dustin, I want you to imagine wrapping up recording another session of the Ham Radio podcast. Matt stops recording. You all have a nice aftercast conversation and you hop off. You continue the rest of your day in bliss until it's time to go to bed. You hit the sheets, lie down, and close your eyes. I have no idea where this is going. Your consciousness starts to fade. You are now fast asleep. You wake up, but something seems off. You don't know what it is, so you check your phone. You see that you were bombarded with multiple notifications, texts, tweets, etc. However, you notice something much more alarming. It's October 1st, 2020. The first thought in your head is, how was I asleep this whole time? Did I teleport into the future? Another universe? Perhaps I should ask someone. Before seeking your answers, you ask what any you do what any logical gamer would do in this situation. You immediately hop onto the computer and launch your web browser. You type into the search bar PS5 and Xbox Series X release date and price. However, there are no results. It seems the price and date have still not been announced. What is your first reaction slash thoughts? Well, if we're doing first reaction and thought to no release date or price, then the first reaction is that it's been delayed. So yeah. that's not a very good answer with all that buildup, <laughs> but that's the answer that I would think if that's the result I saw. So I assume I would I would quickly be disappointed in in a PlayStation as well as Xbox and then try to figure out what's happening with my life after that point in time that I entered a mini coma of what would be a month at this point. NFL dude writes in, I am not sure if this has been asked, but what are the chances of Bethesda selling Skyrim and or fallout four again on next gen consoles? All three of you keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like Bethesda was going to resell them, but now that we have the Witcher three getting a free upgrade, Bethesda's hand has been forced. And I, I think they will change their plans and do free upgrades. I truly do, at least for Skyrim. Here's what I think they'll do is that they'll make the upgrade free if you already have it, but they are going to release a new disc so that when mom is at Walmart and sees Skyrim on PS5 or some kid that doesn't know, then they'll be able to sell it that way also. <laughs> so you're probably right. Yeah. All right. We've got six minutes. We can do it. We can blitz fire these time last ones. Nat natural calamity is right in front of us. He always got the triple. He does. So. Question one, just a dumb thought, but as we are on the edge of making games 4K60, is this it? Have we reached the gaming nirvana? I know Pierce will always say higher, better, faster, stronger, but say we project 10 from now if you own Naughty Dog's next title after The Last of Us 2, which came out in 2023, and it's 4K, 60 FPS, locked with beautiful graphics, but the standard of gaming is 8K, 120. Are people going to demand a remaster for what honestly is a minor gain? Are kids going to look at games releasing now and think, ew, it's 20S Game Pass? I don't know. 20, I don't know what that means. 20s. What happens in 2040 or 2050? Will 20 year old titles seeming uh, seem gross and dated? Or are we plating? Are games going to live forever? I think, 
I think there's a a limit of how far you can go back. Um, I think there's still PS3 games and 360 games that could benefit from being touched up kind of earlier in the generation. But I think for the most part, it's anything that and before. I don't, I don't see anything on PS4 or Xbox One that should be re-released and would really need some major graphical changes. I really don't. As far as the technical aspect that he's touching on as far as 4K and is, is 8K, you know, are we going to keep pushing? I don't think that 4K... I think we're probably going to settle somewhere around 4K or 8K. Honestly, I think it probably is going to be 4K because I think that... People can barely tell the difference between 4K and 8K. I mean, mm. even when I, who I'm like, like I've mentioned earlier, a huge sucker for technical stuff, I I don't really care about 8K. I care about like super high quality panels doing 4K at high resolution. So I think the end game in 20 years is higher frame rates is first of all, I think going to be high frame rate will be the standard. I think hopefully all games will be pushing 120 fps at some point and that i think honestly the things that's going to feel dated in the games hopefully is like ai or and game design is that more technical ability is going to allow us to make games that are even more realistic from a technical mechanical standpoint than from a visual because i do i personally feel like Sure, we can make games look more and more realistic, but I think we are starting to see diminishing returns on on graphics. I mean, obviously, like the new Unreal 5 engine looks amazing, but I think we're going to start seeing less and less. Like, we're never going to have a jump from Super Nintendo and Sega to PlayStation 1 and Nintendo 64 ever again. We're not. That That was the biggest jump. And ever since then, the jumps have been smaller and smaller as far as like mind blown visuals. So I, I do feel like the next big jumps will be in mechanics. Well said, extremely well said question two. Do you think there is a chance Microsoft and Sony make a deal to both delay this November as a lot of big titles are being delayed and it seems less and less worthwhile to even release Uh no shot. No, no shot because play playstation's got exclusives so they're going to release regardless i think right it's just a matter of when and i think they're just being assholes to consumers right i don't i don't see them there's no mutual benefit to making a deal really Mm -hmm. i don't think yeah question three what if sony and or microsoft release the price of both consoles a week or even a month before release do you think it will have the reception that fallout 4 had being released so close to launch or will it be a nightmare I'm going to say nightmare because I don't know how quickly you can produce hardware versus something like software. Software, you can at least get digitally. You can download the game and you can like rush to the digital storefront and eventually get it. Hardware runs out. And especially because I think Carrick had said uh, an episode or two ago how actually he wasn't here two episodes ago. I think he said last episode how they don't even know how many they want to make or they're still figuring out how many they want to make. That PlayStation 5 is going to come sell out. So get your hands on one as soon as possible. I'm right. so terrified one day I'm going to be like, I- I'm going to take a nap and that's when they're going to like release pre-orders or something for the PS5. I'm so afraid I'm going to miss out. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. So something to keep in mind, someone else brought this up. I can't remember who, but I thought it was a very good point. Nintendo did their presentation on the Switch in January of 2017 and they released the console in March. Okay. That and it was fair. just fine. And I thought about that and I'm like, hmm, that is a very good point. So That is a good point. That is very fair. We'll leave it at that. Something All to right. think about. Last question. We're we're making great time here. Oh yeah, we're good. Cal Espera guys wishing you three peace, love, and happiness. Thank you, Coach Blue. I saw Carrick tweet something about possible new Switch hardware. What could we see from a Switch with more power regarding third party ports? Could it lead to more ports in general? Thanks. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think this is. I think it's so crucial for them to have an upgrade ready because the it, it'll become a Wii U situation if they just have exclusives. They need to keep up to some extent with a third party port. Pardon me, holy crap! They need to keep up somehow, and with these games getting bigger, um, they're, they're going to need something to kind of hold them in. 
in my opinion. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think the ports are a nice bonus, but I don't know if anyone's actually buying a Switch for one. Okay. So That's I don't fair. know. I would have to know more about the numbers, about the ports. To me, I mean, I feel like they need to upgrade the Switch because now, especially with the new consoles, I think a lot of people are going to start upgrading their TVs to 4K. And the Switch mm-hmm. is going to look, even their first party is going to feel more dated. Because I know for me even that the not that we need games on Switch to be in 4K, but like the menu is in 720p for some reason. And so I, I just feel like I upgrade. feel for us. Sorry, I cut you off. Go no, go, go for it. I was going to say, I feel for us, the issue becomes really not exaggerated in a way where it's it's we're being extreme. But like for me, I notice it most when I'm editing videos for Switch gameplay and you have the huge black bars around oh, yeah. the edge and you have to like pan and crop it in to make it full screen. Yeah, it sucks. I just I just think it's that's where I'm just like, what the fuck? Like this shit should be full screen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't so, know. Ho- hopefully they they figure it out. Yeah, I think there will be more ports either way, though, because I, I mean, even yeah. though I don't think it's a selling point, I think that they do sell the they may not sell systems but they sell copies so i think it makes it more appealing to make it your main you want to make it as appealing as possible to make it your main console and i think a a hybrid of really good exclusives and having third-party support works especially well for the switch because you have the portability factor so you are taking a sacrifice with that performance up front but it's not like say xbox third party where a lot of times it doesn't run that well on i'm talking about base xbox one by the way doesn't right. run a lot well. Doesn't run very well on that, uh, and they have nothing to kind of beef up the offering and say because like it, you'll just go, why don't I just make PS4 my third party machine? So if if Nintendo can figure that out and just keep the ports present, then they'll be good to go. Dustin, we did it. We made we did great it. time. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. We appreciate Wait, the audience. Oh, Maddie, we got our, our closing segment. I created this segment. Oh, just re- we, we talked okay. about it last week, but I'm making it official T-shirt wars. OK, okay. right now you got to show what are we rocking here? I'm seeing some Star Fox. We're rocking uh, my barrel rollers T-shirt. Damn, kind of like is a good. sports shirt. Yeah, it's a, it's like a sports shirt almost. Because so wearing? so after we talked slightly about how I felt like you were always, you know, showing me up with the cool shirts. <laughs> I went with uh, this shirt I just got, which is here. Let me stand up. Ooh. Which is uh, from Uzumaki, which is Junji Ito. And yes. I saw this shirt and I was like, I, I don't know if I can pull off anime girl shirt. I wouldn't want one like that. I like saw bit... just this, like her eyes. And I okay, thought so... you had the, the main character of, uh, at first I thought you had the main character of Dragon Age or Dragon uh, Quest Eleven. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hell <laughs> yeah, I could see that. So, <laughs> so let us know in the comments who has the better t-shirt. Okay. I'm uh, with that. Either Maddie or I. We should make I that a part of our intro so that everyone's there. Oh, right? that's a good idea. I'd be about that. I mean, this segment can only last so long because there's only we only have so many shirts until we start, you know, buying more shirts. But that's true. But it keeps it interesting when I show up with like a a casual plain white T-shirt and you're mm. rocking the sickest gamer gear and it's just like Damn. Matt. Whose show is this again? Yeah, that's so, right. I think we should keep it up, make it a part of the intro. Let's have some fun. Cool. So let us know, ladies and gentlemen. We'll use the hashtag T-shirt wars. To let us know if t-shirt you got to war. the end. <laughs> let us know if you got to the end. And we'll certainly know, all right? With that, uh, take good care of yourselves, and we will catch you guys next week, hopefully with the trio of us, uh, with episode 268, all right? Peace out.